Hello, everyone, from wherever you're joining. Thank you for being here today for this NCAR Explorer Series lecture, streaming live from our homes to yours. My name is Dr. Dan Zietlow, and I work in education and outreach here at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR, which is a world-leading organization dedicated to understanding Earth system science, and that includes our atmosphere, our weather, climate, the sun, and the importance of all of these systems to our society. I'm really excited to be here with you all today as we learn more about our changing extreme weather with Dr. James Doan. So for this Explorer Series event, we'll be taking questions at the end of the lecture, but definitely submit any questions you have during the talk through the Slido platform. Dr. Doan also has a couple poll questions for y'all to answer throughout the talk, which can be found on Slido as well. So to find Slido and join, if you scroll down this webpage just a little bit, you can see the Slido window just below where you are seeing the live stream video of this event. Also be sure to add your thoughts to our work cloud question. What is something you think of when you hear extreme weather? Because we're gonna to get to that very soon. This lecture is also being recorded and will be available on the NCAR Explorer Series website. So today we are joined by Dr. James Doan from NCAR's Mesoscale and Microscale Meteorology Lab, or simply M-Cubed. Dr. Doan received his PhD in meteorology from the University of Reading in the UK, and has been with NCAR now for 16 years. He's currently a senior Willis Fellow and Deputy Director of the Capacity Center for Climate and Weather Extremes at NCUBED. Dr. Doan works with stakeholders from the energy, water, and insurance sectors to understand our changing extreme weather and climate events, as well as their impacts. He has done work on assessing future hurricane impacts on the offshore energy industry, as well as exploring the value of multi-year climate predictions for water resource and food man and food flood risk management. Excuse me. So with that, let's welcome Dr. James Doan. James, how, how are you doing today? Thanks, Dan. Yeah, doing great. Um, yeah, welcome everyone. It's great to be with you all today. I look forward to discussing extreme weather and what, what we can do about it. Awesome. And before we go uh, much further, James, let's go ahead and see what our audience is thinking about extreme weather. Uh, so Paula Brett, would you be able to share that word cloud with us? And as we wait for that to come up, James, what do you think about when you hear extreme weather? I th I'm always in awe of just the structure and the scale of it and just the power. Um, so I'm fascinated to understand what drives extreme weather. You know, the physical processes that create these structures that just um, have such a large impact on society. Yeah, definitely. Great. So looking at some of the, our audience answers, uh, the big one I see is climate change. So we got, we got a number of people thinking about climate change, uh, danger, chaos, impactful, stay home, property damage, uh, very hot or very cold, uh, too much or too little rain, abnormally strong weather, weather that is damaging, uh, droughts, floods, global warming, tornadoes, hurricanes, unusual. Uh, I think that, that, yeah, so I'm seeing a lot of themes here about um, you know, what's basically happening within climate change, which is great. I think that's, that's a perfect setup for, for what we're going to learn today from you, right, James? Exactly. And, and look at that right in the middle, front and center, climate change. So um, this is exactly what we're going to be discussing today, how our extreme weather is changing. And actually, I noticed a lot of, a lot of those uh, words could be categorized in, as either the hazard, so the wind or the rain, and the impact. So I saw property damage and impact. So we're going to be talking about both of those today. So I'm glad that we're all on the same page there. So yeah, I'll uh, get started here. Great, looking forward to it. So yeah, well, welcome again, everyone. Um, I'm pleased that this is going to be interactive. So please, as you're thinking and listening, please uh, type in your questions to the Slido just uh, below this live stream. And also remember to contribute to the on online polls because I'll be returning to those in a few minutes. So I'm gonna make the case today that we're in a new era of extreme weather impacts. So I'm going to talk about how extreme weather has already changed and how we think it might continue to change in the future. I'll say a bit about how we, how we know things might change in the future. And also I'm gonna showcase a few projects where I have been working with the insurance industry 
to really align the, the science discoveries we're making with societal benefit. So yeah, let's get started. So I, I wanted to start with a bit, bit of background about myself. So I am a weather nerd. Here I are. Here I am standing in some weather. This is accumulated small hail a couple of years ago, just outside the Foothills Lab in Boulder, Colorado. I've always been fascinated by, by the weather and that's what drove me to study atmospheric science at the University of Reading in the United Kingdom. And then following my education, I was lucky enough to get a position at NCAR. So NCAR is such a great place to work. It's full of ambitious people and great facilities and uh, freedom of scientific endeavors. I'm also lucky enough to be connected to what's called the Willis Research Network. So Willis Towers Watson are a global reinsurance company, more on that later. And it's in their interest to know about extreme weather risk and to protect us from it. So I'll say a lot more about that as, uh, in the next hour. I wanted to go back even further in time and just talk about some of my early influences. So I grew up in the UK, so I was an avid viewer of the BBC weather forecasts. So I grew up where that number three is, three degrees Celsius there in North, Northern England. So this guy in particular, Rob McKelvey, whenever he gave the weather forecast, he threw in a, like a science tidbit. And so I was always fascinated by these uh, scientific insights that he threw into the weather forecast. And in particular, what amazed me was that when we look up in the sky, we see clouds, thunderstorms, we actually have math mathematical equations that describe those systems. So it's amazing to me that we can, we can describe our weather systems through maths and physics. Another influence of mine was in my hometown of York in the Northeast England, we had our own extreme weather and that is severe floods. So here's a, a local pub, and this is a particularly severe flood a few years ago, and the flood almost rose to completely submerge the lower story. Now, the interesting thing, this pub is hundreds of years old, as you might guess, and they mark on the wall whenever there's a flood. And you can guess that the most recent floods are right at the top. So there's something happening here. I wanted to give a quick overview of um, NCAR, just to say, uh, why we exist. So we conduct fundamental research into the Earth system. We also support the research community. So we have um, the latest weather and climate models. We, um, we have the latest uh, observational facilities. And we also have a strong education program. Uh, we also extend scientific discoveries to society. So I'll be showcasing that today. And that is now front and center of, uh, of what we do. We also strive for a diverse and inclusive workforce because not only is it the right thing to do, but studies have shown that uh, diverse groups of scientists produce the strongest and most impactful science. And just talk, talking of uh, our science, we do produce the highest quality of science. So this is a, um, a ranking table of a measure of the quality of our science. So you might know that scientists publish their results in scientific journals and other scientists refer to them. So this number here on the right is a, an average number of times that other scientists refer to NCAR published work. And we're right at the top of the league. We even beat the Ivy League schools. This is about five years old now uh, from US News and World Report. So it'll be interesting to see an update. So not only do we produce the highest quality of science, we also produce the most widely used uh, technology. So in particular, our uh, weather simulation model is used in uh, many countries around the world. And here's a time series, this graph here, of the num it's a measure of the number of users of our modeling system. So you can see it's going up um, uh, over time. Now, I would argue that there's room for another metric here, and that is of our impact in terms of um, how usable our science is and how it's used and how it benefits uh, societal decisions. So I expect we'll see more of that going forward. Now, I'd just like to take a pause here and just remind you all that there are some polls coming up. So I hope you've had time to scroll down and fill in the polls. So I'd like to say a bit more about our facilities at NCAR before I launch into uh, weather extremes. 
So we have one of the Gulfstream, Gulfstream 5 aircraft that's been retrofitted for scientific research. So the nice thing about this aircraft, it can uh, fly very high above all our weather systems and look down on them and observe them. Not only that, it has about 11,000 kilometer range, so we can really conduct global studies into, say, atmospheric constituents and pollution and circulation. We not only have aircraft, we have satellites. So this uh, constellation of uh, satellites was launched in the past couple of years called Cosmic 2. So there's a few of these um, in orbit and they all talk to each other and they give us thermal profiles throughout the atmosphere and humidity profiles. So this new data is actually improving our ability to forecast, say, hurricanes. So the final facility I wanted to mention is our supercomputers. So this is one of the fastest in the world. This is up in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And in fact, the machine itself is called Cheyenne. Here's an image of it here. And we need this high computational power to run our complex weather and climate model as depicted here. So this machine here is the equivalent to about 145,000 desktops uh, plugged together. Now, this is a few years old now, and we're lucky enough to be getting a new machine that was actually name, named by a school student in Riverton, Wyoming, and it's going to be called Duratio. So Duratio is the Spanish term for straightforward, and it's a name given for a forward moving thunderstorm system. And that's one of the systems we'll be studying on the next generation machine. And this new machine that's coming online later this year has the capacity to calculate about 20 quad, yeah, quadrillion calculations per second. So that's a million trillion calculations per second. So we should be able to do some great science with this horsepower. Okay, so now I'm going to switch over to our first poll question. I wanted to get your take on what do clim climate scientists such as myself actually do all day? I've said a bit about what NCAR does, but what do I do? And let's uh, see the responses. I'm disappointed to see Snack didn't get any, <laughs> get any, any hits. That's what I've been doing all day. But um, great. I think, I think it's stable. I think you've all settled on all of the above. So yes. We run weather and climate simulations on supercomputers. Uh, we collect observations. There's many other things we do, but these are some of the most important. We snack and we discuss science with non-scientists. And that's one of the key themes I want to bring out here. And it's so critical to align our science. And not only does it inspire new scientific directions, but it facilitates the science being usable at the same time. Okay, so I'll return my presentation. Okay. Now I'm going to use the terms weather and climate a lot in the next 45 minutes. So let's just define it. We can think of climate as your wardrobe and weather is what you're wearing today. So every day, the weather can select from a library of possibilities. So just like when, when you get dressed in the morning, you can select from your uh, range of clothes in your wardrobe but we know that climate, just like your wardrobe, changes. So say you gave some clothes away to Goodwill and bought some new clothes. So now the selection of clothes from which you can select has changed. Some old, you can no longer wear the old clothes and you've got the new options. So just like the weather, some old weather uh, types might disappear and some new ones have appeared. And this is what we mean by weather and climate. And let's also, think about some background about what fuels our weather. Well, of course, it's the sun. So the sun is hot, it emits radiation. Some of that radiation is observed by the Earth's surface, but some is reflected back out to space. Now the Earth itself has a temperature now, so it too emits radiation, but the Earth has an atmosphere which contains greenhouse gases that absorb some of that emitted radiation. And in fact, it sends, sends some of it back down to the Earth's surface. And this is what keeps us warm, this greenhouse effect. So actually greenhouse gases are good. Without greenhouse gases, the average global temperature would be about one Fahrenheit. But thanks to the atmosphere, our 
current climate is about a global average, annual average 58 Fahrenheit. So greenhouse gases are good, but too much is bad. So this is a time series of global average temperatures over the past 170 years or so. So you can see it's been trending upwards over the past 100 years. Now we've known this for over 160 years now. So this Irish physicist, John Tyndall, recognized the greenhouse effect. And about 40 years later, a Swedish physicist actually quantified the warming of the Earth's surface should the concentration of carbon dioxide double. And in fact, his quantification of about nine to 11 Fahrenheit is not too far off what we understand it to be today. But of course, climate has always varied. So let's just look at the past 400,000 years of Earth's temperature. So the red line here is a measure of Earth's temperature. And you can see over the most of this 400,000 year period, we've been cold and in fact, we've been in ice ages. So every 100,000 years or so, we see these spike, warm spikes, the interglacial periods, and luckily for us, we're in one right now. Now the blue line is the concentration of carbon dioxide. So just look at how closely they co-vary. And now look on the right where our carbon dioxide concentration is. And I just checked yesterday, the concentration of carbon dioxide in parts per million yesterday was 419. So we're way up on the, on the right-hand scale there. So what do you think the red line is going to do? Yeah, sure enough, you, you, some of you might be familiar with these uh, climate stripes. So this was a great climate visualization and communication tool developed by Ed Hawkins at, the, at my old university, the University of Reading. So this is a time series from 1895 to 2019 for the average US temperature. So blue colors indicate cool temperatures, red colors indicate hot temperatures. So on the whole, you see a transition from cooler on the left to warmer on the right. But on top of that, we've got you know, red bars in the distant past and blue bars recently. So that's a climate variability. But if you blur your eyes, you can see there's a long-term trend towards warming temperatures. And these warmer atmosphere can hold larger amounts of mo moisture. So today's extreme weather is operating in a very different atmosphere than it was even 30 years ago. So it's really inconceivable that these weather systems have not already changed. And in fact, these climate stripes have gone viral. This person even uh, kitted out their Tesla with stripes. I'm not sure I'd do that, but I don't have a Tesla. So. Um, and in fact, it was show your stripes day two days ago. So if you follow that hashtag, hashtag show your stripes, you can see what other people have done with these stripes. It's even uh, that you, people have knitted their own scarves and sweaters. Anyway, we've had our, our own recent extreme event last weekend where many temperatures were smashed across the US West. And a lot of people were talking about the daytime highs, but what I found most remarkable was the, was the hot nights. And in fact, Death, Death Valley recorded its hottest night ever with a morning minimum of a toasty 104 Fahrenheit. Unbelievable. And of course those temperatures are really exacerbating the current drought right across the West. Here's an image of Lake Oroville so the hotter air is really thirsty. It sucks more moisture out of the Earth's surface than, than standing water. And in fact, Lake Oroville is about two, almost 200 feet lower than it was two years ago this month. Okay, well, let's have a look at a times, time history of the numbers of damaging extreme events. So this is compiled by a reinsurance company and we're looking at a 40 year history going back to 1980. So the line on the top, the orange line, is uh, for all types of disasters. And you can see the numbers have about doubled in the past 40 years. And that will just concentrate on the top line. That is largely due to weather and climate events. Things like earthquakes have stayed, stayed about flat. And along with that, we've seen increasing losses. And the, so this is a time history again of 40 years of global total losses in US billions of dollars adjusted to 2019 value, values. So the blue line is the total losses, the red line is the portion that was insured. And so you can see 
today's losses are about four times what they were back in the early 1980s. And that's largely because there's more of us and we have more stuff, there's more expensive assets in harm's way, but also there's a climate change component here. So again, I just wanted to take a pause here and uh, remind you all to scroll down and fill in uh, the next poll because that's coming up soon. So these disasters are becoming increasingly costly. Let's zoom in now on the US to see where the most costly disasters are. So the, the darker the color, the higher the total losses. And this is 40 year total losses. So you can see Texas, Louisiana, Florida stand out, the Gulf Coast states, but also California and maybe North Carolina and New York. So yes, a lot of this is driven by the high population in these regions, but they're also regions that experience severe, severe weather. So then this brings us on to the second poll. So I wanted to get your take on what type of extreme weather is the most costly. So let's, uh, let's see what you all think. Thanks, Paul. Okay, the number seems stable. So the clear winner, flooding, and then a tie for second place between tropical cyclone and the hot, ex hot and dry extremes, drought and wildfire. Thunderstorms and wind storms, they don't, don't really register. Good. So we'll, we'll keep that in mind. I'm going to uh, tell you what the numbers show now. So let me uh, return to my slides. OK, so we think flooding is number one. So let's see what the National Center for Environmental Information tells us. <clears throat> So I'm starting with the, the least costly first. So you were correct. The winter storm and freeze is indeed the least costly. The 40 year totals in current dollars is between 70 and 150 billion US dollars. Next up is actually flooding. So between 100 and 200 billion dollars. Of course, where a lot of us live on the front range of Colorado, flooding is probably the biggest uh, risk. Um, we are exposed to large hail, but flooding is the big one here. Um, and actually, I think under climate change, as we'll discuss later, the proportion of losses due to flooding may overtake these next ones I'm going to introduce. So the next one is severe thunderstorms. This includes uh, severe thunderstorm winds, tornado, large hail, and flash flooding. So that's estimated to be at least $250 billion. The next one is actually drought and wildfire at between $350 and at least $450 billion. And top of the list is tropical cyclone. So this includes hurricanes. And the estimates are at least $1 trillion over the past 40 years. So this gives us a total of almost $2 trillion of losses over the past 40 years. So clearly, extreme weather has a huge economic impact. And uh, we have opportunities here to mitigate much of these losses. So uh, I'm going to move on to the world of insurance now and a bit later in the talk. So it's remarkable to me that over half of these losses are uninsured. So let's see the breakdown by continent. So Australia has just over half of its total losses are insured. The US, including the Caribbean, has under half of losses are insured and that number reduces for the other continents. And much of the uninsured losses are taken up by governments or they're just written off. So I think we have an opportunity here to develop some uh, more robust risk management strategy for, the, for the, this uninsured portion. Okay, so hopefully we take a breather now. Hopefully I've motivated that we're in a new era of extreme weather impacts. So the extreme weather itself has changed and so have we. This figure illustrates that concept nicely. This is Hurricane Laura last year in the Gulf of Mexico. So Laura was different than it otherwise would have been if it, if it um, occurred 30 years ago. But also our population has increased and we're increasingly living on, in the vulnerable coast. Now into climate change. And so we can think of climate change as a pervasive and growing risk multiplier. So of course the risk, was already, risk of extreme weather was already there. We can think of climate change as compounding that risk and it's ever present and ever growing. So now I'd like to talk about what we, changes we've seen already and what we expect to see in the future. 
but before I do so, I'd like to say a bit about how we know some of these things. So Angkar is a world leader at simulating future weather and climate. So let me just explain briefly how we do that. So I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we have mathematical equations to describe things like clouds, winds, snowpack, stream flow, ocean currents. And then we tile the earth and its atmosphere. And in each tile, we have these equations and each tile talks to each other. And we take a snapshot outside the window of what's going on, uh, feed it to these equations and then run the whole thing forwards in time. And it then tells us what the state of the weather is going to be one hour from now, one day from now, and then out 10 years from now or hundred years from now. And of course, this is very expensive. And that's why we need our, our supercomputers up there in Wyoming. Now, if we make these tiles small enough, then we can simulate extreme weather. And so this is remarkable. This is a visualization of a simulated hurricane. So it looks just like the real thing. And this is purely from math. That's what amazes me. So we can track these things, count them, and we can look at how they're changing over time. Are they getting bigger? Are they moving faster? And so what are these simulations telling us? So let's first think about how hurricanes have already changed. So this is a, an analysis of some of those simulations, but also an analysis of the observed historical hurricanes. So I mentioned earlier that the environments within which hurricanes occur have changed. So the oceans are warmer, the oceans are higher, and the atmosphere is warmer and more moist. Now, most scientists will agree that climate change has contributed to higher storm surge heavier rain rates, and also an increasing fraction of major hurricanes. So that means that every hurricane that comes along today is more likely to be a strong hurricane than it was, say, in the 1970s. Now, we've detected many more changes in hurricanes, but we don't have enough data yet to attribute those changes to climate change. So scientists are busy uh, trying to pin down some of these other, other changes we've detected. How about looking into the future? Well, indeed, uh, our science theory and simulations tell us that future changes are expected. So we fully expect that the rising seas will compound storm surge. We fully expect that rainfall will become more intense. Now we're less confident that it's more likely than not that we'll see a modest increase in average wind speeds of hurricanes. And it's more likely than not that we'll see an increasing proportion of these strongest storms. So that's a continuation of the observed trend. We also have some evidence that the hurricanes will be larger in terms of the area of damaging winds. Uh, evidence for a poleward shift in the location of peak strength. So the storms will attain, become strongest at higher latitudes. This is particularly um, alarming prospect for locations like New York and Tokyo. And we have some evidence for a slowdown in forward speed. So there's, instead of coming ashore rapidly, they'll crawl ashore. So this is another alarming prospect because locations will therefore experience damaging winds for longer and the rainfall will be heavier. So we expect some uh, quite significant changes. So we're gonna move on to our final poll. So I wanted to get your take on how many tropical cyclones are there around the world every year. So let's uh, see what you all think. Very nice. You've all hit on the correct answer, 90. That's great. I guess my next question for you all is why is it 90? And in fact, if you were to ask scientists that question, why is it 90? Not many of them would be able to give you an answer. In fact, we don't really know why there's 90. Um, we have various theories, but one hasn't really risen to the top. And perhaps related to that, we're not entirely sure whether we'll see more or fewer hurricanes in the future. So the balance of evidence suggests there'll be fewer in the future, but a number of robust studies point to more hurricanes in the future. So really we need to um, 
need to solve this problem. And to do so, we need everyone around the table. So I'd encourage anyone to uh, become a scientist. Uh, there's power in numbers. Okay, well, I just wanted to um, just review some of these changes again and try to understand why we're seeing these changes. So I talked about heavier rainfall in the future. And just to give the example of Houston, so Houston is no stranger to extreme rainfall. And in fact, the city of Houston recently quadrupled its risk from extreme rainfall. This is largely due to Harvey and other associated tropical cyclones. So why is that? Well, these mathematical equations, they tell us that for every degree Fahrenheit warming, we can expect a 4% increase in the rain rate. And this is a fundamental scientific principle that um, we can really um, tie a lot of our understanding to. So we're very, very confident in this change. What about stronger winds? Well, here's a, an example of the devastation brought by Hurricane Michael in 2018 to Mexico Beach in the Florida Panhandle. Some of this devastation was caused by uh, water, but a lot was caused by winds. So why are these winds increasing? Well, we heard that the oceans are warming and hurricanes get their energy from the ocean. And so um, it follows that the hurricanes themselves, are the wind speeds are becoming faster. And how about a storm surge? This is an image during Sandy in 2012. Um, well, we do indeed expect higher storm surge, partly because the seas are higher. That's due to melting of land ice and the fact oceans are warmer and warmer water occupies a greater volume. But also because the wind speeds are increasing, so the winds actually push the water and pile it up ashore. Okay, now I've talked a lot about hurricanes and that's because it's my primary area of expertise, but what about other extreme events, you might be wondering. Well, let's move on to severe thunderstorms. So these are the, um, the severe events that track across the Midwest and primarily the Midwest and the, the Eastern parts and produce tornadoes, large hail, <clears throat> flash flooding. So on the left is our climate simulation of thunderstorm tracks. And on the right is observations of thunderstorm tracks for a single season. So you can see on the whole, our model does a good job at capturing this the, the pattern of these tracks across the United States. And so we can actually run our model for hundreds of years and look at how these tracks are changing. So let's see what our model tells us. So here's a snapshot of tracks in current climate. So each line is an individual thunderstorm and we can zoom in there on the Houston region and the tracks are colored by how intense the rainfall is. That's for current climate. Compare that to the end of this century see the density of tracks is much, much greater. So there's more thunderstorms and they're darker, so they're more intense. And in fact, we're seeing four times the number of strong storms at the end of the century than we currently get today. Not only are we seeing more of them and they're becoming more intense, but they're getting larger. So thanks to Andreas Prine in uh, NCAR for sharing his work today. So here's a a typical thunderstorm in current climate. And here's the, the same typical thunderstorm in future climate as per our model. So it's more intense. In fact, the in intensity goes up by 30%. It's also larger. So the area of intense rainfall increases by 88%. And so that means that the total water volume coming out of these systems more than doubles. Now these storms are huge systems with their so-called organized uh, convective systems. So let me overlay the boroughs of New York just to give you an idea of the scale of these things. So they would impact multiple catchments simultaneously um, in ways that we haven't experienced before. The problem with that, of course, is that a lot of our in existing infrastructure is very old. So thanks to my colleague Tanya Lopez Cantu at CMU for sharing this comparison photo of downtown Pittsburgh. It's the same street corner, 100 years apart. So you can see a lot has changed. The thing that hasn't changed is the stormwater infrastructure. So clearly a case could be made, but increasing the flow capacity of these, uh, these drainage systems. And in fact, my conversations with the um, Mile High um, flood 
control district here in the front range indicates that um, we're fairly well positioned here in the front range. We're, we're in good hands, so uh, we can take comfort in that. Okay, well, let's think about winter storms. So we can see studies have shown that we expect bigger snowstorms in a warmer world. Rather paradoxically, in a warming world, we still get snowstorms, of course. Um, perhaps few of them, of them overall, but the ones that do occur, occur in a much warmer, sorry, a warmer and more moist atmosphere. So these storms are more juicy, they have more, more, more moisture to snow out. And then we move on to hot and dry extremes. So many of you in the front range will have woken up to uh, a sunrise that uh, peered through some smoke. And already this year's fire season has seemed to have kicked off to an early start. <clears throat> I think over half of our firefighting resources are currently engaged, which is fairly alarming. So early in the year. And last year, of course, California had the devastating fire season. Siberia had uh, unprecedented intensity and aerial coverage of fires in 2020. Then, of course, Australia in the 2019-2020 fair summer had a devastating fire season. So this warmer world we live in is more thirsty. The, the air is sucking the land surface dry, creating tinder dry fuels, a lot drier than otherwise would have happened 30 years ago. So just continuing on the theme of wildfire and focusing in on California, this study showed that the number of extreme fire weather days has doubled compared to say the early 1980s, that's shown in this paper here. Um, so that's due to, um, due to the temperatures rising and due to shifts in the precipitation distribution. So other studies have shown that the, the rains in California are arriving later in the fall. So this extends the duration of the fire season. And of course, you probably read in the news that there's been severe impacts of these, these um, new fire seasons. The local uh, power company, PG&E, instituted a policy of de-energizing the power lines in advance of severe fire weather. So when there's a strong wind Santa Ana event, they basically shut the power off. So this study here <clears throat> looked at the risk of power shutdowns in current climate and future climate. So let me tell you what you're looking at here. So up the, up the left side, we're looking at the numbers of people impacted. And the black line is from all lines. The gray bars are from high voltage lines. The two lines on the left are for what we can think of as current climate. The two bars on the right are for dry autumns consistent with what we expect from climate change. So there's actually the difference between these is about 70%. So a 70% increase in the people affected by these power shutoffs. So clearly, I think it's time for a discussion about this power shut off policy and what, what could be done about it and how uh, we can work together to come up with more effective policy that mitigates some of these impacts. Now that was hot and dry. We're gonna stick with California and think about wet. So we think about California's other big one. So of course the big one is quake. The other big one is a month long deluge. So thanks to my colleague, Daniel Swain, for sharing this slide. So did you know back in 1862, downtown Sacramento was flooded and people got around on boats. And in fact, the most of the Central Valley of California was flooded from a month long, basically continuous rain. So can this event happen again? Well, this study here found that yes, it can happen again and probably sooner than we expect. So this graph here goes from today out to the end of this century and is the cumulative likelihood of this event happening again. The dashed line is without any effects of climate change. The solid line is with climate change. So it's a fairly alarming prospect, but it's more likely than not, we'll see one of these events in the next 40 years, according to this study. And so that would be disastrous because this other study by uh, Wing quantified that there's $763 billion of assets in California's floodplain. So this is the disaster waiting to happen. Okay, well, that was a quick whirlwind tour of 
what we can expect extreme weather to look like in the future. So now I'd like to showcase a couple of examples of how I work with the insurance industry to align the science with societal benefit. So let me explain how this works. So we have two pillars here, the insurance solutions on the left and climate science on the right. I work in this green collaborative space <clears throat> where we are transforming climate science and risk management practice. So the goal here is for science to be inspired by the needs of risk managers and for risk management practice to be informed by solid science. So the great thing for me is that it inspires me to think about climate and extreme weather in ways I would never have imagined alone. So it's a really um, rich process. So let me give you a few case studies. <clears throat> Before I do that, let me just tell you why the insurance industry are interested in extreme weather, as you might imagine. Hurricane Andrew in 1992, it really rocked the insurance world. You remember this was a category five that went right through um, Homestead, uh, close to downtown Miami. And this led to many local insurance companies going bust. They couldn't afford the payouts. And that's because they were looking at the past history of hurricanes to estimate their risk, they, and they couldn't afford the actual risk that was changing. They just didn't know about it. So they realized they can no longer look at the past to think about the future. And in fact, one of my insurance colleagues is famous for saying, it's a modeled world. So this reflects the fact that we can no longer just use observations. The records are too short. Um, we can't estimate, say, the one in 200 year event on a 50 year record. So this led to a few um, private modeling companies springing up, the names of which are some the famous ones are here. And so these are so-called catastrophe models and they quantify the risk from extreme events. And so I'm part of this Willis Research Network. So it's a, um, a collaborative between public science, such as NCAR and various universities around the world and the world of finance. And so we work together to align our latest scientific understanding of extreme weather with uh, insurance solutions with the goal of uh, strengthening societal resilience to extreme events. Now, the first project I'd like to just showcase what I'm calling the NCAR Willis Towers Watson Hurricane Wind Simulator. So we developed a new model of the surface wind fields of hurricanes. And this is what it looks like for the case of Hurricane Maria over Puerto Rico in 2017. So hopefully you can see the out outline of the island there. The hurricane track in black from the bottom right to the top left. And the colors you're looking at are the surface wind speed. So the blues are the strongest winds and the greens are the lightest winds. So you can see the winds are strongest over the ocean, as you might expect. Uh, they reduce over the land because the land is high friction. Uh, but there's some strong winds inland associated with mountain tops, and the winds decelerate over the urban area of San Juan. And that's because um, urban areas are very rough and they really put the brakes on hurricane winds. And actually, that's unfortunately why these urban areas are damaged because they absorb a lot of the shock of these winds. And so we use this model to develop some scenarios of future hurricanes. So let me tell you how we do that. So this is an example of how I modified Hurricane Irma in 2017. So you're looking at South Florida there. Hopefully you can see the tip of Florida and the Florida Keys. So if you look at the top left panel, this is the um, actual Hurricane Irma. Again, the colors are the surface wind speeds of the hurricane and the black line is the hurricane track from south to north. Now I modified this hurricane case according to our understanding of climate change. So we know the winds are likely to increase in the future. So we, we bumped up the wind speeds for Hurricane Irma in our simulation. That's the top middle figure. The top right figure, we made the winds larger, so greater extent of strong winds. Uh, the bottom left, we uh, made the storm make landfall faster, so it came ashore faster. And then the bottom middle case is all three of those changes together, stronger, larger, and faster. And then the final case is a track shift where we move the track from an East Coast landfall to a Miami landfall. 
I should caveat that by saying that the faster scenario um, was more a sensitivity study rather than a climate change expectation. So the insurance company then took these wins and plugged them into their loss model and calculated losses to their portfolio of insured properties. So let's see what they found. So the, um, <clears throat> the stronger scenario in the top middle, we found that the losses doubled compared to the actual losses. The top right, the larger scenario, led to just a 10% increase in losses. The faster scenario in the bottom left increased losses by 20%. All three together, stronger, larger, and faster, caused losses 2.5 times what actual losses were. And maybe not surprising, if we shift the track to Miami, the losses tripled. And so the insurance company are very interested in these losses because they want to ensure they have sufficient capital to pay out if these events happen. So let me say a bit more about the world of reinsurance and also how, how they're using this information. Now, reinsurers, their role is to provide insurance to insurance companies. So you can imagine a, a local insurance company in Miami, if it gets hit by a category five again, then it may go under. So it buys, that insurance company buys insurance from the reinsurer. Now it's just like homeowners insurance where they have a deductible or what's called retention here. So up the left here, we have loss from a hurricane event. And so if the loss is only extended up to $10 million in this idealized uh, scenario, uh, that is all retained by the insurer. But the insurer has options then to buy coverage should the loss exceed 10 million. So they can buy coverage in layers. So they can estimate or guess which layers they're going to be exposed to. So if they, if they think they're only going to get a $50 million loss, they'll buy coverage in the first three layers and perhaps not buy coverage in the final layer. So the reinsurer then, or Willis Towers Watson, are very interested in these climate change scenarios and which layers the climate change scenario will push them into because they need to make sure they can um, have adequate capital to cover these losses should they occur. And so that's what they plugged those losses and calculated how far they expend. So that was an overview of one um, project. Let me just give you one more, and this is the final one. And that is where we looked at building codes. So how effective are they actually against hurricane winds? They're designed to be effective, but can we quantify it? So again, this was motivated by um, recent hurricanes in Florida ever since the 2004 season. Interestingly, Florida implemented a new, very strict building code in about 2002, and that's what we're testing here. The second question we ask, is it cost effective? So is it effective economic policy? So let's see what we did here. So we were lucky enough to get our hands on some lost data from these seven hurricanes that occurred in 2004, 2005. So the colors here indicate total losses for these seven events. The redder the color, the higher the loss. So you can see the entire state is covered in losses. In fact, we had a total of $5.2 billion in insured losses in this data set. Let's have a look at how these losses vary by hurricane. <clears throat> so let's compare Charlie and Francis both impacted Florida in the same year. The damage pattern was very different. So Charlie was in a category four intense storm, but very small. So a lot of the losses, although they were high, they were confined close to the track. Francis, on the other hand, was a very large storm, covered the entire state. So the losses spread much more broadly, but the peak losses were lower. So it matters what hurricane you're talking about when it comes to losses. So we combine these loss data with our wind data to really quantify the effect of these building codes. And we actually found that yes, indeed, the Florida building code is effective against hurricane winds. And it was remarkable to me that we found that if you build the code, you can expect your losses to be reduced by 68%. That was compared to homes not built code. So it really is highly effective. And in fact, we've we found for every dollar spent building to code, you can expect $4 back in reduced losses. So it really is effective policy. And so there's conversations ongoing about 
um, how other states might want to emulate the Florida building code, other states with less stringent building codes. Okay, well, we're nearing the end now. So before I leave you, I just wanted to highlight what's, well, what's, what's coming in climate science. Well, there's a lot. The one thing I want to focus on that I'm most excited about is the fact that extreme events know about each other. So just look at this satellite image of three hurricanes near the, near the Gulf of Mexico and in the Caribbean. So clearly they're connected somehow. Uh, they're not occurring randomly and uh, <clears throat> they might be connected to a common uh, driver, such as the warm ocean. So much like buses, you can wait forever and then they all show up at once. And that's actually quite important because the impacts of these groupings or clusters of extreme events often exceed the sum total of individual losses from individual events. So we really need to be aware of these groupings of events. And the, the other question that we're trying to answer is whether the fact they're coming groups make them more predictable. So are we able to better forecast these events because they're connected together? So I think that's gonna be exciting in the next couple of years. Okay, my final point is that Congress is engaged in this topic. So I was lucky enough to be invited to testify before Congress, specifically the House Committee on Science, Space and Technology back in September, 2019, where I talked about extreme events and climate change, just like I did today. And I made the case that uh, these partnerships uh, between scientists and different societal sectors are essential to really drive the science forward and make it aligned and useful and usable by people who stand to benefit from it. So that brings me to the end now. So um, that was a whirlwind tour of extreme weather. Hopefully I made the case that we're in a new era of extreme weather impacts. We can think of climate change as a pervasive and growing risk multiplier. The good thing is we know, we know what to do about it. And really one effective way that hopefully I've articulated today is this deep integration of science and risk management across various sectors, not just insurance, but across a whole multitude of sectors is set to really revolutionize our resilience and our ability to confront climate risk. So well, thank you all for listening. I hope uh, that's triggered some thoughts and some questions and uh, I'll hand back to Dan. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, James, for you know sharing all your knowledge with us. This is, to me, is super interesting. So I'm sure everybody out there also thought it was super interesting as well, especially this idea about how extreme events know each other. <laughs> um, and how, you, I, I mean, that's something that I think scientists in general are super interested in studying is the interconnectedness of all of these different systems, you know? Cool, so let's let's dive into the questions. I see we have a, a number of questions already. Um, so let's just stop with, with, start with the top rated one right now from Annarelli. And Annarelli is asking, uh, you know, we, we talked a lot about hurricanes and floods and, and Wildfires, is there a place on earth that is at the least at risk from climate change impacts? That's a great question. So whenever I think of climate change impacts, I always go, go first to temperature because that's what we understand most. So obviously the whole earth is warming. Some parts are warming faster than others. So we know um, the polar regions are more warming a lot faster than uh, equatorial regions. Um, I think the region, if I had to give an answer, I mean, nowhere is completely free, but uh, areas that might be least impacted from change are probably somewhere in the middle of the open oceans away from hurricanes, such as in the South Atlantic or the, um, I'll leave it there. Yeah, great question. I'm sure someone could answer that better than I did. That's a complicated question too. <laughs> Great, um, so the next question is from Joel, who is asking, how do you think climate change is impacting severe weather outbreaks in the US? My anecdotal observation is that we seem to be getting fewer of these events. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting one. Um, <clears throat> so the study I presented indicated we may expect more in the future. So I'm thinking severe weather outbreaks as in severe thunderstorms, such as you know, summertime thunderstorms in the, mid, in the Midwest, for example. 
and on the whole, climate change is shifting our daily weather patterns from more sort of benign weather to extreme. So perhaps paradox paradoxically, we can expect um, more severe weather interspersed by longer periods of benign weather. Um, so in that sense, there may be fewer episodes of events, but when they do come along, they're likely to be more intense. And that statement is true across a multitude of extreme weather phenomena. So I think that's a very interesting, interesting fundamental principle. Um, there's a lot more I could say about severe weather systems, but I'll leave it for now. Great, thank you. Uh, so the, ne the next question uh, from Curious, I may loop in with uh, a similar question further down um, that you may, you may or may not have the, the expertise to answer since you, know, you, you don't physically do the insurance side of things. Um, but curious is is interested to know about you know maybe you can provide some insight on what you see maybe insurance companies doing in terms of like would they increase rates or would they kind of use these different clauses like active god to maybe uh, limit the coverage that they, they could distribute from some of these events yeah great question i think the interesting thing is um if insurance companies get nervous and they don't understand enough about the risk they just pull out if they're regulatory, if, if, if they're allowed to by regulators. For example, the Northeast US um, experiences, so I'm talking like Boston and New York, they experience hurricanes very rarely. We don't really understand the true risk in that region because there's been so few of them. Um, and so a lot of companies are very reluctant to take on exposure in that region. So they just pull out. Um, the uh, another thing I can add is um, flood insurance in the US. So historically and today, it's covered by the federal government. But a lot, a lot of private insurance companies are very interested in um, <clears throat> in understanding their role in strengthening our resilience to flood. And so there's a lot of studies going on to better understand our flood risk. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure about the act of God, but my experience has. They only, they only sell insurance when they're sure they have the capital to cover it. And that's a, that's a role for science to really understand the, the true risk. Great, and our next question is from uh, Annarelli, who's interested in knowing uh, what is a weather phenomena that you first experienced when you moved to the US from the UK? I have a, a funny story on that one. When I first moved to the US, moved to Boulder, Colorado, we got nine inches of snow. I was supposed to go to my friend's house. And so I call, called up and say, oh, I, I guess we'll have to reschedule. And he's like, what? Why do you have to reschedule? <laughs> There's nine inches of snow on the ground. So uh, <laughs> extreme, actually, this is an important point. Extreme weather is all relative. So if, if we had even two inches of snow in the UK, the you know, cars grind to a halt, there's days off school. And so the impacts of extreme weather more relate to the rarity of it than the absolute magnitude. And so there's a lot of work going on to understand uh, rarity and how that's changing compared to the absolute magnitude. So great question. And the next question is also from Annarelli and they're giving us this, this question about you know, how, how we talk about climate change almost. So, so when can we stop referring to climate change as a future thing? So yeah, exactly. Uh, I can jump in there. Um, I fully agree that, um, you know, the, the days are over when we can talk about climate change is happening in the future, that a portion of it has already happened as hopefully I made the case today. Absolutely, the future's already here and it started um, 30 to 70 years ago. Um, so yes, we can stop, stop referring to, the, to that right now. Um, we've seen it, we see it in our models, we've seen it in observations. Um, yeah, multiple viewpoints, multiple ways of knowing points to the fact this portion has already happened. Yeah. Great, and our next question is from Michael. Are El Nino and La Nina patterns changing with the other climate changes? That's a great 
Great question. Yeah, so El Nino and La Nina are examples of climate variability. So this is the, um, the sloshing back and forth of warm water across the equatorial Pacific that happens on time scales of say two or three years. Of course, the El Nino and La Nina doesn't operate independent of um, the climate system and studies have indicated that the, um, the characteristics of El Nino and La Nina may change in the future. Um, it's too early to say, I think, whether they've changed already. Um, I'd, I'd like to see longer data records that we can obtain through our weather simulations to see whether they've changed already. But I think I would argue that um, we would expect some changes given that then they're intertwined with the mean climate, yes. Great, and our next question is from Debbie. Um, and I think it's referring to the uh, thunderstorm, the simulated thunderstorm tracks from an earlier slide. Uh, but do the thunderstorm simulations include the Western United States? Absolutely. Um, I think the tracks, tracks I showed today were um, the strongest storms, which um, primarily occur in the Eastern US, but, oh, indeed, the Western US. In fact, uh, we were just talking, that, talking about that today. Um, these severe storms operate over the southwest US associated with the, um, the monsoon system. So yes, and not just the Western US, you know, they operate globally. Um, there's a, a few large uh, research projects ongoing at NCAR looking at the characteristics of thunderstorms in South America, for example. I think we have a lot to learn about how these systems are different in the US to other regions in the world, what drives them, their characteristics and their changes in time. Mm -hmm. Great, and our next question is from Curious, who wants to know, what are local governments doing to limit losses in areas where extreme weather are frequently happening? Yeah, I like that. I like the framing of that question. It's not what are individuals doing, it's what the local government's doing, and that's spot on. Uh, I mean, there's a large array of community interventions to adapt to extreme weather and to mitigate further changes in extreme weather. So take the case of hurricanes, for example. Uh, a few communities around the hurricane-prone coasts are really shoring up their wetlands um, to make sure they don't lose them, because we know the wetlands really act as a break on hurricane winds. They can really drop hurricane categories before they start impacting urban areas. So these wetlands are critical. So a, a government, at the governmental level, they can institute policies to protect wetlands, for example. Another example is to change um, how we evacuate from hurricanes. So making it equitable across society, for example, people without their own vehicles and just making it a safe thing to do, a safe and affordable thing to do so people are protected. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah, thanks for sharing that insight. Uh, and, and like you said, it's a great point that you know, I think of this, the Science Moms Initiative, for instance, where they're, they're really trying to emphasize collective action rather than individual action, because mm -hmm. that's how we're going to solve some of these issues moving forward, for sure. Exactly. Yeah, I think if the, if the governments um, make make the um, the climate adaptation and mitigation effective actions the easiest thing to do, then that'll it'll naturally follow that, that we improve in our ability to adapt. Yeah. And our next comment is from Stacy. And Stacy, I just want to say I really appreciate you adding uh, this to the discussion. Um, and Stacy says, "Didn't Eunice Newton Foot determine CO two as a greenhouse gas before John Tyndall?" And I think this is a great example of how we're reckoning in the sciences with, you know, how we talk about science in the Western science tradition and how historically we have marginalized groups within within the sciences. Mm -hmm. And and James, I saw you you began to respond. So maybe maybe you have some thoughts on that. No, absolutely. Yeah, no, this is um, valuable. Thank you very much, Stacey. I did not know about you, Miss Newton Foot. So um, I need to be educated. Thank you for that. Thank you for adding and contributing to the discussion. Yeah, I believe there was there was a a, a good article in the New York Times um, last last sometime last year that had talked about um, how you know Eunice Foot had made some of the first observations that you know CO two could actually be changing temperature, and then that just kind of got lost to history because of. 
structure. Sure. Well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, so yeah, Stacy, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, so moving to a question from Connor, uh, a question from Connor, excuse me, how can emergency managers and insurance companies use the data collected to better prepare for the next big extreme weather event? Yeah, insurance companies always want to understand their historic losses. Um, so, for example, I keep coming back to Hurricane Andrew. So, you know, they suffered severe losses in that event. They don't really understand why, or they didn't at the time. <clears throat> Is it due to um, attributes of the structures they insure? Is it due to some vulnerability factors um, of the infrastructure associated with the infrastructure? Um, or do they not understand what they're insuring very well? So there's a lot of uncertainties involved in pricing risk. So they're very keen to use as much data as they can get their hands on to understand what drives their risk and how to optimize their portfolios to be resilient. So for example, <clears throat> particularly when it comes to reinsurance, they don't want to put all their eggs in one basket. So they wouldn't just insure Houston, they'd want to insure say Houston and Tokyo with the understanding that it's highly likely both of those cities will not be hit within the same um, insurance period. It might still happen. And actually they're very interested in these connections across basins and across cities. Um, they don't want to expose themselves to a risk, an unknown risk they're not aware of. So, um, yeah, more data, the better. Great. And our next question comes from Jenna, who wonders if the warmer air can hold more moisture. Why is the Western US in such a massive drought? That's a good one. Yeah, I was just thinking the same thing. Uh, yeah, so I write. I think we all were in the West. <laughs> yeah, I, I rightly said that warmer air can hold more moisture. And that's true. But it only can if the moisture is available. So what's happening in the Western US right now is that the surface is I think record dry, almost as dry as it ever has been. So there's just little moisture for the atmosphere to absorb. So not only is it hot, it's also very dry. Um, and it's also thirsty compared to the amount of moisture it could hold, it's holding capacity. So yeah, once, once some of these um, droughts kick in, it can really lock in hot, dry air and very difficult to shift. And unfortunately, that's what it looks like we're seeing right now. And it seems to be extending now up to Oregon and Washington. It looks like Washington in particular and Oregon, Portland, Seattle and the interior cities are going to experience record-breaking heat this weekend and into early next week. So um, it's a particularly dangerous situation when it doesn't cool down at night in these regions. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's also a, a, you know, a social science component too that uh, a few people at NCAR are studying of, you know, if we have these massive heat waves, you know, how is that actually affecting the people living in them? Mm -hmm. uh, so our next question is from Jane and it looks like it's a follow-up from the previous question. Uh, so besides just being in the middle of the Atlantic, <laughs> where, where can we live, say, on this continent? I would argue we can, we, we can live anywhere. Um, you know, we've always, lived with the risk of extreme weather. Um, there have always been very severe storms, severe hurricanes, snowstorms, floods, tornadoes. Um, they're changing, we're changing. I think we have an opportunity now to change in ways that reduce our exposure to these systems um, and institute policies that protect us from the severe weather. So I think we need to accept that severe weather will still happen. They might impact us to some extent, but we can we can reduce that impact and bounce bounce back or bounce forwards in a more effective manner. So, yeah. Great. And our next question comes from Rachel, who's wondering what upcoming remote sensing satellite yet to be launched are you most excited about? That's a great question. Um, I'll start by saying satellite atmospheric science is not my, my primary area of expertise, but I've been excited by the um, by these really just the level of detail you can get from satellite information these days. So these rapid scans where you get 
you get an image every minute to say the, the eye of a hurricane um, in unprecedented detail. So you can really see what's going on inside the eye and how it evolves throughout the lifetime of the hurricane. And this is important because there's some, there's some things we just don't understand about um, the drivers of extreme weather and how they behave. And so this, these new data at the very small scales at which a lot of um, impacts occur, um, that's really where this data is key. So I expect we'll learn a lot more about um, <clears throat> the impactful scales of extreme weather through the this next generation of satellites. Cool. So if we, as we wait for any kind of last minute questions to trickle in, I, I have a question for you. Um, for, for any of our students or, or young scientists that are listening right now who may be interested in you know, studying extreme weather or working with insurance companies, like what, what, what's some of your advice that you would, would give them to start down on that path? <clears throat> yeah, firstly, I think if you're interested in it, that's, that's the most important thing. I think um, the challenges are easier if you have an inherent uh, long-term interest in them. Everything gets easier. That's, that's what I've found. And in fact, um, the job I'm doing now sometimes feels like um, a hobby, you know, I, I do it because I'm genuinely, genuinely interested and fascinated in understanding how things work. So once you've got that, uh, I think uh, things become a lot easier. So maybe a bit of practical advice. Uh, it's important to, um, to gain experience in to what the world of research looks like. So places like Angara and other research institutions, they often have a very um, invigorating and broad visitor program. So for example, at NCAR, we have opportunities to come and visit uh, across different age groups, different school levels and university college and, and upwards. Uh, we have various opportunities to come and visit and actually talk to the scientists and find out what they do and just get, get an understanding whether that interests you. Um, so yeah, making connections is probably the most important. And, and we, as NCAR scientists, we love to interact with, with people who have an interest. Uh, we like to talk about our science with anyone. So yeah, everyone's very welcome. Awesome. And I don't see any, other, any more questions coming in. So with that, James, thank you so much for being here to chat with us today. Um, and you know, it was really great hearing all about the work that you do and learning about kind of our changing extreme weather. Yeah, well, thank you. And th thanks everyone for your input. The great questions and uh, you all got the correct answers on the poll. So thanks very much. And I also just want to give a quick shout out to the, the team behind the scenes. So to Paul, Brett, Aaliyah, and Lorena, thank you so much for supporting the event today. Uh, if you are interested in more NCAR Explorer series events, definitely check out our website for any upcoming lectures and conversations, and as well to view recordings of past events. So I hope to see y'all next time and have a great rest of your day.